entitled, In the Event of an Emergency. In the Event of an Emergency. The Lord gave me this message toward the first of the year, and every time I tried to preach it at another church, the Holy Spirit would say, No, Deborah, this is for your brothers and sisters at Jerusalem, not when you go out. This is for them. And so this is my first time preaching this year, and I am grateful to God for having this opportunity because there's a word from the Lord. Never in my lifetime have there been more emergencies than there are now. Medical emergencies, environmental emergencies, terror attack emergencies, and yes, even in the church, spiritual emergencies. You could be sitting at home watching your TV any time of the day, and, you, and all of a sudden you will hear this annoying noise, bomb, bomb, bomb. This is a test of the emergency broadcasting network. It's only a test. My God. And so our world is full of emergencies even more now than it ever has been. It's amazing to me that after thousands of years, the Lord still has to deal with some things in the church. My God. But I'm here this day to inform you that he can and he will deal with it. By the time we get to this book of Revelation, the writer states that there are some things that must shortly come to pass. And even in these emergency situations, we serve a God who loves us. And he takes the time to assess and, and evaluate and treat any emergency that we may come upon. But he says there's a condition. You've got to have an ear. He, he who hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Lord is trying to say on today. The Lord encourages us through John at the onset of this book by saying if we can read this, if we can hear it, and if we can keep it, we will be blessed for the time is at hand. This letter to the churches represents real situations they call for real repentance, and they offer real hope. I heard the preacher over here this morning tell us in, in Bible church school, we're just here to convey the message. And so I'm here this morning to let you know that there's hope in the event of an emergency. Even the Apostle John is writing in the midst of an emergency situation, for he has been exiled as a prisoner to the island of Patmos. This is a time when there's extreme persecution going on for Christians. And in the midst of this situation, John is given prophecy regarding spiritual warfare. How many of y'all know we are in the midst of spiritual warfare? We as the church, it is right here, my God. We are in the midst of it. John writes this letter under the direction of the Spirit of the Lord. And he's been sent, this letter, these letters have been sent to comfort us, to challenge us, to proclaim to us, and to give us pastoral encouragement to the church. I love it. The Word of God says God gave it to Jesus. Jesus sent it to the angel, and the angel spoke to John about it. And so we know it's real and it's relevant. I am encouraged by the theme of this book. The theme is the Lord God our Almighty reigns. The Lord omnipotent reigns. And, and I understand that, that, you know, I have read this. I've read the end of the book. I understand that God reigns and the devil loses and I win. And while I would love to just park there and rest in the assurance that I belong to him, that I'm a Christian, that I'm saved, that I'm a believer, however you say it, you know, I could rest right there. But my spirit... Is restless because he opens this book with a word to the church my God John is in the spirit and I heard this urgency of his voice as he lays out what Jesus Christ reveals to him by this angel he that hath an ear let him hear my God what the spirit is saying and so by the time we get to the end of this book and to the end of time as we know it the Lord has to deal with us, not so much the world, but us, us believers, the church, the body of Christ. Well, how does he do it, Deborah? He does it with commendations, and, but he also does it with warnings, and he rebukes, and he reprimands. That's the kind of God that we serve in the event of an emergency. Emergency is a serious 
unexpected and often dangerous situation requiring immediate action. An emergency, it's a crisis. It's an urgent situation. Church, there's a word for all of us, and all of it is not pretty. We are in an emergency situation, and it's time for immediate and drastic action. And so if you have an ear, a spiritual ear, you need to hear, you need to listen. This is not the time for hearing impairment, my God. So out of the seven churches that the Lord reveals these letters to, it, it's interesting that, that, that preachers are standing up now and saying that, you know, 99% of the church is not doing what the Lord has called them to do. They're not living right, not doing right. But I submit unto you that as I prayed and meditated on the Lord, he showed me something at the end of the book, at the end of time, out of the seven churches that he lists here in Revelation. There's two of them that get no rebuke, my God. So that let me know that five out of seven are not doing all they're supposed to do. So I, I did the math. I'm, I, I like math. And I found out that not 99%, but 71% of the church, if you use this as a guide, is in trouble. Uh-huh, not 99%, but God's got a lot of folks standing up witnessing and representing and being ambassadors for him. Can I get an amen for that? Uh-huh, yeah, yes. Yeah. It's, it's probably not as bad as we think it is, although we know we're in an emergency situation. So two of the churches, the church at Philadelphia and the church at Smyrna, receive commendations. God tells them, in essence, keep up the good work. Keep the faith. You're going to be persecuted. You're going to go through, but just hang in there. And stay with me until the end. And so we observe by reading the first and second chapters of this book that there are many situations that I would consider are spiritual emergencies. For example, a lack of fervent love for Jesus Christ. That was the problem with one church. There was tolerance of, 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 of immorality, idolatry, false teaching. One church was accused of that. Uh, there was a, a church who was just indifferent and plain, straight up, flat line. They thought they were living, but as it turns out, they were dead. And this is just to name a few of the things that were going on with God's people. I'm talking about the church, y'all. Despite a book full of inspiration, instruction, and insight, the church has fallen down in a very public way. You may not recognize it, but through the power of the Holy Spirit, I invite you to recognize, somebody said recognize, uh -huh, that we are in a crisis mode. The time is now to take some drastic measures. The need is urgent. The need is immediate. It needs to be done right now. I have been teaching CPR for nearly 30 years now. And while some of the techniques have changed, some of the maneuvers have changed, the end result remains the same, and that is to save a life. Well, I'm here to tell you that I believe that the reason the Lord makes such an appeal at the end of time is because he wants to save a life. How many of y'all know he wants to save a life? And not just a life, but the life of the church. And so he sends these letters out to representative churches and let them know I'm making an appeal. I'm giving you a second chance. How many of y'all know he's the God of a second chance? Uh-huh, yes, he is. Yes, he is. The Lord wants us equipped because we've got a great commission. We've got commandments. We've, we've got things that we've got to do for the Lord. And he wants us walking right and talking right. But how can I help somebody if I'm in a constant emergency uh -huh, situation? How can I help you if my life is one crisis after another? If I'm always calling and saying, help me over here. I'm in an emergency. God is saying that we've got to get it together. If I'm in a fire all the time, how can I help you put your fire out if I'm constantly, my God? He's a God who pairs his judgment with mercy. And with every church, you see it. You see him appealing and saying, I see what you're doing. You're making a mess. But if you'll just do what's right, he's got promises. He's got provisions attached to obedience. That's all he's calling for. He's just calling for us to be obedient my God 
He needs disciples, does he not? He needs us to walk out the plans that he's got set forth for his people. Somebody's got to stand up. Somebody's got to be a representative of what our God is standing for. So while we wait for a perfect heaven, guess what? We're going to live right down here uh huh, in an imperfect earth. And God is calling us, if you've got an ear, if you've got a spiritual ear, if, you're, if your heart's right, if your conscience is right, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says. This is going to be a real short message, I'm here to tell you. But I mean what I say, because God means what he says. So what do we do in the event of an emergency? Three points, and then I'm going to take my seat. Point number one, we as the church should strive to operate in the Spirit. I'm talking about the Holy Spirit. And folk are still saying it don't take all of that. But I'm here to tell you that the Word of God commands us. Ephesians 5, 18, Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the... He commands us. You need Him. Because if you leave yourself to yourself, you're going to be in crisis mode. I'm just here to tell you. It is not human suggestion. It is not human recommendation. It is not human proposition. It is not even human excitement. But the word of God says, and ye shall receive power after the Holy Spirit. How many of y'all want the Holy Spirit? Uh -huh. After the Holy Spirit has come upon you. My God, he's been sent to guide us, to comfort us, to help us. Because we are more pitiful than we really realize we are. We are in crisis mode. My God, and he sent him. So strive to operate in the spirit, the Holy Spirit. Number two, know who you're dealing with, but recognize who you have with you. Uh-huh, know who you're dealing with. Uh -huh. There's some stuff that we got to call out because we need to know who we're dealing with. But at the same time, you need to recognize who's got your back, who's right here with you. And, lo, I am with you always, even till the... He's here. He's here. It's up to us to invite him in and be, to be with us. My God, I invite you to go back and read chapters 2 and chapters 3 of Revelation, you will see that if you do what is right, he is on your side. Yes, he is. He's all-powerful. He's all-knowing. He is described as a source of strength and comfort to every one of these churches. Uh -huh. He promises each church who has an ear to hear victory through faith and obedience. It's just that simple, my God. And so lastly, number three. Maintain a spirit of expectation and worship. When you come into the sanctuary, somebody say you get what you're looking for. Uh-huh, you will get what you're looking for. If you're looking for expectation from God, if you're looking for worship, you can get it right here. My God, maintain a spirit of expectation and worship. Come into the sanctuary with Praise in your heart, on your lips, with your hands lifted up, right? Whether in the physical or in the spiritual, you need to maintain a spirit of expectation. In CPR, it takes a team. And, and, and in the church, guess what? It takes a team. And so if you think you're going to come in here and do solo, God forbid, he calls us to work together. The church is the body of believers, not, not just the preacher, not just uh -huh, one or two people, but it's a team. And with CPR, I'm going to get you to raise this up for me. In CPR, we used, to, we used to teach that, you know, it was an individual thing. You do CPR, you know, one-on-one. -on -one. We finally went to going to having a two-man uh, CPR, but, but in, in our most recent revisions with CPR, it's a team effort. I'm here to tell you that, um, and, and see, I know the Lord, this is the Lord, because one day this week, I had Sister Wanda Williamson to come to me, and she said, Deborah, I was at some church tonight, and they had an AED, and of course, I've had an AD, AED since June, but I kept it at home till the Lord said, you bring it out, you bring it out when you tell them 
about what happens in the event of an emergency. And so I'm going to be teaching a class in a couple of weeks, and we're going to be talking about this AED. This AED, um, most of them cost three, four thousand dollars. Guess what I paid for this AED? AED. The Lord is so good. I applied for a grant and was awarded this uh, AED. I'm going somewhere. I'm going somewhere. It really has nothing to do with me. But if you're going to work on a team, you need to help. Uh huh. You need to make sure that you're helping and that you're not pulling away from the team and causing division in the team. But you need to be helping. Doing all you know to do to make ministry work. Why, Deborah? Because we're here to draw others to Christ. We're here to save a life. It takes a team. It takes more than one. And so as we maintain this spirit of expectation and worship, if nothing jumps off, if nobody has a cardiac arrest, guess what? In the spirit, we just may have an arrest. We, we may have somebody who feels hopeless and helpless. So we need to assemble the team because a life needs to be saved. And while we're caught up in our issues and our personal things and trying to showboat and be saved, God has saved their lives that need to be saved. He that had the deer, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. If something jumps off, we need to know who we are and whose we are. It takes a team. It takes a team. I can't get away from it. It takes a team. And if an emergency erupts in the physical the leader, who's the leader? The leader's the one who knows about the AED. They'll say, you, go get the AED. You, call 911. And in the spirit, you need to let the leaders do what the Lord has called them to do. Somebody's over there dying. You, you who's filled with the spirit, go over and help them. They need deliverance. They need to be set free. Help them. Because it takes a team. It takes a team. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. So if something jumps off, handle it. And then get back to praise and worship. Because we come in to praise and worship him. I hear our pastor often saying that you enter to worship, you depart to serve. That's why we're here. We're here to get what we need so that we can go out there and save a life. I teach CPR. It's practice time. I submit unto you that we're in here to practice. We need to be practicing the love of Christ right here in these four walls. And then when we get out, we can do what the Lord has called us to do. Practice. Practice the love of Christ. Practice the gifts that he has given you. Because it's all about worship. It's all about Jesus. My God. Take care of whatever emergency arises. And then get back to preaching. Get back to teaching. Get back to doing what the Lord has called you to do. My God. This is practice time. This is the Lord's day. It can just not be another Sunday. Come in here, same old humdrum ritual routine, but this is the Lord's day. And it's about him. It's about his glory. Do you want to see him when you come in? Why are we here? We are in an emergency situation. My God, and we've got to see what's going on here. We are here to worship him with everything that we've got. He's described in this book. He is the one who is, who was, and who is to come. He is the almighty. He is coming in the clouds, and every eye shall see him. He is the alpha. He is the omega. He is the beginning, and he is the end. He lives. He was dead. 
and he is alive forevermore. He opens and no one shuts. And check this out. He shuts and no one opens. This is the God we serve. Why wouldn't you want to come in and worship him? He is the lion of the tribe of Judah, my God. He is a lamb who was slain, my God. He loved us, and he sent his son to save us. And so in the event of an emergency, I'm here to tell you that you better call on Jesus. While I get to AED and do what I do, we need, some, we need a higher calling. We need somebody who can operate in the spirit to get us where we need to be. There's too many fires. There's too many emergencies going on. And we need to take care of this stuff that's happening I'm finished, I'm finished, I'm finished. It's a whole lot, a whole lot in these chapters, and I don't have time to talk about all of them, but I'm going to ask you all to stand, and, 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 and this is it, this is it. So I'm here to make an appeal. If you like Smyrna and Philadelphia, where everything's hunky-dory, and, 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 and you're, you, you know, even in the midst of persecution, he told uh, Smyrna, if you'll just hold on, some of y'all going to be put in prison, and, 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 and some of you are going to be killed, but if you'll just remain steadfast, he told the church in Philadelphia, uh, uh, it's going to come a time when, these, when, when this house of Satan is going to see, see y'all worshiping, and, 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 you know, and you're doing well, just keep doing what you're doing. If, you, if, 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 if what I'm saying about these two churches symbolize you, then you just stay right there. But let me talk to you about these other five churches. The church at Ephesus had lost their first love. What does that mean, Deborah? It means that church had become routine. We, we, I'm, I'm going to Jerusalem today. I, I'm just going because that's what I do. If you have lost your first love, if church is not as exciting as it used to be, if you have no zeal, then I invite you to come right on up here to the altar. To the church at Pergamos. What did they do, Deborah? This was a compromising church. They compor compromised their immorality. They, they were corrupt. They were doing things that they had no business doing. And so if you've compromised, if you know you're not exactly where you needed to be, I invite you to come right here. My God. To the church at Thyatira. They had allowed fornication to run rampant in the church causing all kinds of corruption, all kinds of immoralities. If you find yourself there, I invite you to come on up. And to the church at Sardis, who had a name that they were alive, my God, but they were actually dead. If you are in a dead situation and you don't realize that you're dead, I'm here by the Spirit of the Lord to let you know you can be revived again. You can be revived again. And lastly, the church at Laodicea. They, didn't, they wasn't hot. They wasn't cold. They were just sort of straddling the fence. And whatever you do is all right with me. If you're in that position, I invite you to come. Because I know a Savior who can answer all things. I can't do it, but he can do it. And so I invite you to come. If you find yourself anywhere among these churches, I'm coming down, so I'm going to need you to pray because I need some prayer, okay?